2014, we had these incredible storms. It started blowing, I think, before Christmas and ran on till into March. But it wasn't just the wind, it was the strength of it. There was endless, like, you know, 90 mile an hour wind. We had the worst storms that we've ever seen. They were off the charts. In 2008, Lion Bay received protection from bottom toed fishing, so no trawling and no dredging from 2,006 square kilometres of seabed. But what's quite unusual is this whole area was protected from bottom toed fishing, but you could still set pots and nets and you could still dive for scallops. And so this gave the opportunity for the seabed to be protected in the bits of areas we've got, but also for it to recover and hopefully you know, these, these big reef systems become more widespread and protected um, through time. The government had taken a gamble to close this area. They needed to demonstrate, we needed to demonstrate that it was, it was going to be worthwhile. And thankfully, Plymouth University got that contract and started setting up um, what turned out to be this incredible sort of... Uh, long-term data set that is now reaping some massive rewards in terms of better understanding of reefs and things like that. The problem was that it became a magnet for static gear, for large numbers of pots and nets, and uh, that was beginning to drag up the very reefs that had been theoretically protected. And so Blue Marine Foundation, uh, my charity, suggested to uh, the local regulators, to the scientists, to the fishermen, to other conservationists, that we should set up a working group to try and address this problem and manage Lime Bay and its reefs sustainably. The Lime Bay project is the finest example in the UK of, um, of, of work that's been undertaken to understand the impact of declaring a marine protected area. Because we've been monitoring these reefs since 2008, we had this amazing baseline, understanding how these reefs were recovering over time compared to areas that were still open to fishing. And then when the storms hit, we then had an opportunity to compare uh, the impact of the storms to this baseline that we had. It blew for two, three months, phenomenally much stronger than normal. And then it took maybe another two weeks for the water to clear for us to dive. So there was no dead scallop meat, it was just big piles of empty shells washed up against sort of bits of reef and that. One of the interesting things that we've seen is the rate of recovery from the storms appeared to be greater than the rate of recovery from fishing. Initially it was looking quite similar to when we first arrived in Lime Bay after trawling, but the key thing was even though those reefs weren't resistant to the initial impact of the storms, what we saw by continuing to survey the reefs every year was that they bounce back and are bouncing back so much quicker than they ever did from years of bottom toed fishing. The idea is that if you have a really intact ecosystem with lots of diversity, lots of you know, big organisms, it's a little bit more um, able to deal with our activities and our impacts and shocks than uh, a more degraded system. So we will be able to test this and there's two different parts to resilience. There's firstly resistance. So if you've got a protected system, does it um, resist those sort of changes more than a, than, a, than a stress system? So you don't actually see the impact so much. And the second most important one probably is the recovery speed. So do um, the, these the more diverse protected systems recover faster? And so again, we were able to test this um, following the storms. And what we found was that um, whilst the actual seabed was really quite badly um, impacted and a lot of the organisms were, you know, were removed, um, what we found is that the speed of recovery um, following the storms was much quicker than the speed of recovery following the sort of chronic impact of fishing. We have to um, extract still frame grabs from the um, moving video. So we do that using specialist software. Um, and then we, we watch the videos through um, and we count all mobile and conspicuous species that we see between the two laser dots. 
So we've um, got this unique uh, data set that's got really high resolution over long time periods that has mean that we've seen marked increases in the number of mobile species and the diversity of these mobile species. And because of this data that we've, we've got over 11 to 13 years now, we can use this to um, champion this type of management elsewhere and also use the information to uh, improve management in other areas. The research that we've undertaken at Plymouth University has enabled us to track the social and economic impacts of the Lime Bay closed area and also through this storm period that occurred in 2014 in order to be able to inform the evidence base for marine protected areas and sustainable fisheries and protected livelihoods. The problem for everyone associated with fishing, with the, with the industry, with the environment of the seas is that it's a case of out of sight, out of mind. We don't see what's going on beneath the surface, beneath the waves. So this research that Plymouth University is carrying out just helps to demonstrate that uh, by putting in the right safeguards, by cer certainly stopping some activities, you can allow a rejuvenation, a healthier seabed, the opportunities for fish stocks to, to, to grow, for ecosystems to be protected in ways which won't harm the future commercial interests of the fishing industry, but in the long term will be to their benefit. Oh, yeah, without a doubt. I mean, from my point of view, had we not had a protected area, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing now. My diving was every year while the dredging was going on was getting worse and worse. So eventually I would have had to have given up. Um, but the protected area hasn't just benefited the guys who are scallop diving, you've got all the guys with static gear, there they were catching more, more crabs, more lobsters. So it was rather a win-win. And none of the towed gear boats that were you know, based in the ports that are in the protected area have gone out of business. They're all still there, all fishing and all, as far as I know, earning a reasonable living out of it. So I think it's a win-win a for everybody. It's been an absolute privilege to monitor the recovery of the Lime Bay Reef so far, but we still have so much more to do. The species we're monitoring haven't reached a plateau yet. We're still monitoring this you know, change over time. And what we really want to know is what do natural communities look like? And so within Lime Bay, we, we still can't do this because we still have all these other human activities ongoing. So what we really want to see is more of Lime Bays around the country, some areas that are protected like Lime Bay, where you exclude the whole area from bottom toad fishing. But even more, we want to see some areas that don't have any human activity so that we can truly understand what natural reefs can look like so that we can then um, properly uh, manage these areas going into the future.